Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about T-bone crashes, one of the fatal crashes uh, that you could potentially be involved in, usually when executing a left-hand turn. Stick around. We'll be right back with that information. Hi there Smart Drivers, welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about T-bone crashes and hopefully keeping you safe when you're making left hand turns and at other points that you may be involved in a crash uh, that potentially could be fatal. So Sadaf is here, Prestos here from Fort Worth, Texas. So if you're just tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from and what class of license you're going for. Uh, Michael is here, thank you for that compliment. Michael, I'm glad that we can help out and keep you crash free. Uh, Carrie's here from Minnesota as well, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the 100K campaign. I had another meeting with Ann today, and uh, we're working towards uh, helping Ann uh, raise money for an electric wheelchair. So that's what we're going to talk about today as well. We'll talk about the presentation, talk about T-bone crashes, and give you some information about that and keep you safe on the roadways. And if you're looking for the defensive driving checklist, look down in the description there and you can find that down there. Without further ado, uh, that plays. Hello, yes, Katie's listening from Arkansas. So we have a few people here as well. So we're gonna head over to the presentation and Katie's studying for her learner's permit. So let us know what class of license you're going for, uh, what, what aspect, which part of your license you're in for and we'll get you going on that. All right, so here we go. PowerPoint presentation, we'll get over to that. Get going on the right screen here, here we go. All right, so we're talking about car crashes today. We're particularly talking about the T-bone crash, which is often fatal because unfortunately there are limitations to automotive technology. There just isn't enough space in the vehicle to uh, protect vehicle occupants. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and the reasons why these types of crashes are often fatal. If you're new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I do have a PhD in legal history. Uh, throughout the 1990s, I was a truck driver driving long haul from uh, Ontario, Canada into the United States. Mostly ran everything east of the Mississippi, but I did make it out to California and Texas and places like that a couple of times. I was a regional uh, and bus line uh, coach captain for uh, one of the bus lines there in Australia when I lived there and was going to university there. Uh, 1997, 90, 1998, I became a licensed commercial driving instructor. So <laughs> I've been doing this for quite a number of years now. And in 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with a doctorate in legal history, which is a study of policing courts and prisons. And oddly enough, my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. So that's who I am. As well, uh, have a look at this uh, article, Spinning Our Wheels. It basically talks about, uh, it's a history of you know, automotive safety. If you're interested in this, it was published in an academic journal and refereed. And basically I argue that you know, driver education has had little influence in reducing the number of traffic crashes on our roadways, mostly due to advances in medical science and automotive safety features, airbags, seat belts, those types of things have been responsible for reducing traffic fatalities. But we have not reduced the number of traffic crashes that occur on our roadways, although most of these traffic crashes tend to be not as fatal. So, and the other thing is, is that uh, one author wrote some years ago that if you took all of the traffic crashes and put them in one place at one time, you would have a national disaster. You would have cause for national emergency. And the reason for that is, is in the 20th century, uh, traffic crashes killed, injured, and maimed more soldiers than, uh, or sorry, traffic crashes killed, injured, and maimed more people sent to war, or <laughs> injured more people than soldiers sent to war in the 20th century. So we're talking about the First World War, the Second World War, the Vietnam War, uh, and we're just talking about a tremendous number of people. So in terms of things that kill human beings at the beginning of the 20th century, it was war, famine, and disease. At the beginning of the of 2000s, it was terminal illness, suicide, and traffic crashes. So uh, it still happens a lot. The problem with traffic crashes and the reason that they tend not to be in the public eye very much is because that they're 
a very short duration within a couple of hours generally traffic crashes tend to be cleaned up and so people don't see them a lot of them in urban areas are minor and those types of things and uh, you know people just aren't at that intersection or at that place so they don't see the traffic crash that it happens uh, and but a lot of people are injured and maimed especially if uh, you know people are involved in a rear end collision they tend to suffer for years because they have soft tissue damage and those types of things so one of the things that I want to talk about and give you some awareness about because I've been I've, obviously this is what I do for a living so I spend a lot of time thinking about this and one of the realizations that I had in the summertime was uh, based on the information that 40% of traffic crashes or more than 40% of traffic crashes occur at intersections intersections are the weak point in our road traffic system so when we look at roadways we have intersections everywhere and this isn't just something that happens in traffic it's also something that is uh, something uh, that is thought about in terms of security systems because all security systems have seams it's where we place security cameras for example around our house there are always blind areas between two cameras you can't see everything with cameras and those are called seams they're the weak point in the system uh, shift changes for nurses at hospitals you know things tend not to get done shift changes for police at police stations and those types of things because you're making a transition from one uh, one shift to an, the different shift and in that there's a transition and in that transition you have a weak point and you know, we don't want to point this out for criminals too much but it does happen and intersections in the road traffic system are seams and this is where most of the trap almost half of the traffic crashes occur so we're going to talk a little bit about intersections and where do we find intersections because uh, if we can keep you if we can get you thinking about, apologies about this, I didn't mean to have that in there. Uh, if, you can, if you can start thinking about where intersections are, uh, then you can scan intersections better, be pre better prepared to deal with the sheer number of things that you have to deal with at an intersection. And first and foremost, one of the things you wanna look at is you wanna look at this intersection sign. Many people do not see road signs, and I, uh, I can attest to this by teaching drivers who are upgrading to commercial licenses the truck or bus uh, it, one of the difficult parts is to get them to read road signs and I can understand why this is a difficult task for many drivers in many places there are so many road signs there's so much information at you that people find it difficult to prioritize the information that is being presented to them on road signs so these intersection signs often get lost and people are not seeing them they're not paying attention to road signs and they're not looking at the intersection and thinking okay this vehicle may run the stop sign this vehicle may run the traffic light and enter the intersection and I could potentially collide with that person so if you can identify intersections and not just conventional intersection where one road intersects with another one but on freeways as well on on ramps and off ramps those are points of intersection it's where you're going to intersect with other traffic now on ramps and off ramps saying that in terms of a freeway or a highway tend to be less dangerous because traffic is moving and getting out of one lane into another lane it's not the same as a t-bone crash in a conventional intersection so let's go back to talking about crashes for a moment uh, one of the reasons just sort of the anatomy of a crash when a vehicle crash occurs there are three crashes first is the vehicle striking an object in this instance of the image here it's the car striking the utility pole the car comes to a stop you have the energy of the vehicle being dissipated and dispersed uh, when the vehicle comes to a stop there's you inside of the vehicle or the vehicle occupants you have to come to a stop as well because you're traveling the same speed as the vehicle for example if you're driving at 30 miles an hour you too are driving at 30 miles an hour and have to come to a stop and this is the reason that we've implemented seatbelt laws and we've put airbags into cars is to try to decelerate to to slow down your decelerate rate of deceleration so that you don't just in a very short period of time in a couple of feet go from 30 miles an hour to zero miles an hour so there's you coming to a stop 
seat belts and airbags have prevented us coming to colliding with things inside of the vehicle and this was once a problem before the 1960s when they sort of got on board with traffic safety and then finally the last collision is the your internal organs slamming up against your chest cavity and oftentimes if there's a great deal of speed involved in your car uh, this can cause a great deal of <clears throat> this can cause internal injuries in your body so this is sort of what happens when a traffic crash occurs so the the types of traffic crashes that you can be involved in head-on crashes t-bone crashes rear-end crashes and sideswipe crashes and the first two head-on crashes and t-bone crashes tend to be fatal now automotive safety has addressed the first one head-on crashes automotive technology uh well we'll first talk about road engineering road engineering we know uh, as traffic safety experts that drivers tend to fatigue and their attention begins to wane after a couple of hours of driving so if you're driving along from one city to another and it's a couple of hours you'll start to notice that when you get sort of beyond the two hour mark that you'll see the concrete barriers in between the lanes of traffic and the reason for that is to prevent uh, lane crossover so you crossing across one lane of traffic into the oncoming traffic we know that for a fact the other thing that we've that uh, automotive safety has done in terms of head-on collisions is, is that we have crumple zones in the front of the vehicle. The engine compartment and the fenders and the hood, all of that is a crumple zone that dissipates the energy that is involved in a traffic crash so that even though the car looks completely destroyed upon impact, the reason the car looks destroyed is all of that is absorbing the energy from the forward motion of the vehicle and protecting the vehicle occupants. So the everything around the, the 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 occupants inside the vehicle is destroyed, but the occupant compartment of the vehicle remains intact and it saves your life essentially is what it does. Also we have airbags and seat belts. Now, T-bone crashes don't have the same uh, features inside of the vehicle that we can use to protect vehicle occupants and this is right why t-bone crashes often tend to be fatal and this is the reason if you open the doors on your car you can see that the door is only about six inches thick and there isn't anything inside the door panels there's plastic on the inside and there's a th thin sheet of metal on the outside the doors are actually hollow as well in, in the event of a t-bone crash it's not that one the, the vehicle that's striking the other vehicle is hitting it at a flush 90 degrees so the energy is dissipated over the front of the vehicle dissipated over about six feet or eight feet or whatever the width of a vehicle is oftentimes it's the vehicle that's driving into the other vehicle is at a bit of an angle so all of the energy is concentrated in a very small area it's concentrated in a couple feet on a door panel and finally, the other uh, limitation, physical limitation, is the fact that where the vehicle hits on the front, you are sitting there and it's right where your internal organs are. It's usually on your chest cavity. And this is the reason why these are fatal because the limitations in automotive engineering, there simply is not enough space there as there is in the front of the vehicle that it will protect vehicle occupants. So when you're making a left-hand turn, know that if you're involved in a t-bone crash it's often going to be fatal not just for you as the driver but if you have passengers in your vehicle they are going to sustain serious injury so here we're going to talk about overall i should add this slide before the other one but vehicle safety features crumple zone safety class breakaway steering column safety restraints airbags these are just some of them and as you can see here on side impact bars they are beginning to put these in some of the vehicles but again because of the limited distance between the outside of the door skin and the inside where the vehicles are, are where occupants are sitting rather there's very little protection in the vehicle that to protect uh, occupants in the event of t-bone crashes and as i said t-bone crashes often happen on left-hand turns often happen at complex intersections uh, what happens is, is that drivers misjudge the gap and they go they get pressured the social pressure from other drivers on the roadway and they get anxious and feel that they need to go and I too am susceptible to this when I first started driving truck made a left-hand turn out onto a highway because I'd been sitting there for so long waiting for the appropriate gap uh, I felt I got pressured by other drivers to go and 
uh, you, you know, that just comes with experience that you can say, oh, well, I, you know, the gap is not sufficient and I need to go. So inexperience often leads to misjudging the gap and go. And the, some of the other stuff that I've been talking about this week in terms of left hand turns, uh, turning left on a yellow light, you have to ensure, check and double check that the oncoming traffic is actually coming to a stop. Uh, when you're moving through the intersection and you move into the path of oncoming traffic because you are in the line of fire uh, when you move into that across that uh, lane of oncoming traffic. All right, so the, one of the other things that I've kind of invented here is called the jig jog and you can see that in the left hand turning vehicle and if Corey's here he'll put that video up for you. Uh, so what happens is you're in the left hand turning lane you can see here in the image that there's this large truck across in the turning lane on the other side of the intersection. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to move out to be able to see around this large vehicle. If you can't see around the large vehicle, you kind of have to move to the left a little bit, not into the on oncoming path of traffic, and then straighten your vehicle out again so that in the event that you get rear-ended, you're not going to be driven into the oncoming traffic. And I call it the little jig jog because it's a fairly aggressive working of the steering wheel to get your vehicle back to straight so that you can see past that large vehicle by moving out to the left and again when you're turning left look and look again and make sure that the gap is sufficient for you to get across two lanes of traffic for example it's going to take you approximately six to ten seconds depending on the size of your vehicle to cross those two lanes of traffic so that gap has to be sufficient and if you're just learning how to drive oftentimes I recommend that you work with a driving instructor or you work with an experienced driver that can help you to determine that gap so you can get that experience as well because it's something that's difficult to teach when you're in a vehicle doing videos it's something much easier to do if you're working with an experienced driver that can help you out with that all right so we will have question and answers now so good luck in your road test and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer so we'll slide back over here and we'll talk about answering any questions about t-bone crashes and whatnot and help you out with that. All right, so Colin is here, uh, Corey is here, Bricks for Wheels, and Colin is uh, traveling gaming as well. So Drive Smart BBC, BC, more than 50% here in BC according to ICBC. So uh, depending on where you are, but overall generally 40 plus more is sort of the, the statistic that gets put out there in terms of traffic crashes that occur at intersections. but. Tim is saying that here in BC, according to uh, their statistics, ICBC is the licensing authority here in British Columbia. They also crunch all the statistics for crashes and whatnot. Uh, they're saying that more than 50% of crashes occur at intersections. So it's important, as I was saying in the presentation, that you, you identify intersections, you're aware of intersections, and you're scanning the intersection thoroughly because uh, there's a video from Australia dash cams that uh, one smart driver put up for me and the, it's from the person who struck the other vehicle and you can see the car coming from the left uh, and pulls into the intersection and the person driving straight forward I'm like what was that person thinking about you can hear them talking and they're obviously not scanning the intersection or looking at the intersection they're simply driving straight forward and you know it comes back to that saying you can be right or you can be dead right because again you had the right away and you're going well I had the right away the other person was completely in the wrong the person drove out in front of me it still doesn't matter you still have to fix your car you still risk injury you still risk death by being involved in a crash and how long is it going to take you to, to fix your vehicle to get insurance claims and those types of things because I've had experience of dealing with insurance companies and they're not they're not just going to hand you money you need to prove to them that you have a claim a valid claim and it can take some time sometimes it can take quite a while before you see that money and recompense for being involved in a traffic crash uh, Jonathan I saw a video where a drunk driver going over 100 miles an hour hit another car that was turning left on a red uh, left arrow light at an intersection a child died in the crash yes and th you know that's unfortunate and as I said it has been put forward that if you took all the cra traffic crashes that occur in one place uh, 
in one country in one place at one time you would have a national catastrophe and that is simply the truth because there are a lot of traffic crashes that occur uh, presto what about uh, Rolls-Royce with so much insulation in the doors does that help a little bit with safety of course yeah presto anything you know you have these high-end luxury vehicles they they have much more safety features in them than what you know most of the vehicles that are coming off the assembly line are going to have for the most part however that door panel is hollow and we do have side impact airbags now and those do add some added protection but there are simply physical limitations that cannot be overcome in terms of physics in terms of dissipating the energy uh, that is involved in traffic crashes you have to understand that we have the, the first vehicles are big they're heavy most vehicles weigh anywhere from two to six thousand pounds depending on what kind of vehicle people are driving and then as i said when the vehicle comes in so this is the front end of the vehicle when it's hitting the side of the other vehicle it doesn't hit square on like this it often hits on an angle like this and you get all of that energy from the traffic uh, from the collision concentrated into one small area and because you're sitting in the vehicle here from where you're sitting to the outside of the door panel is only about six or eight inches there simply is not enough distance between you and the outside of the door panel to dissipate that energy it's not like in front of the vehicle where there's you know anywhere from sort of four to six feet of front end engine compartment that they can use that to dissipate all of the energy in the vehicle so it's important to identify intersections to scan if you are making a left hand turn at the intersection to make sure that the gap is adequate when you're making the left hand turn so that you're not involved in a t-bone crash and not to get pressured by other drivers and i said if you do get pressured by other drivers and you're susceptible to that then work with a driving instructor work with an experienced driver who can mentor you to identify that gap and as well in the uh uh, learning to judge gap video which Corey will get up for you uh, I recommend that if you if you don't understand gap and how much time you need to get through an intersection go out to traffic and then you know look at the traffic off in a distance and then count how long it takes for you for that vehicle to get to where you are on the roadway that way you can begin to understand gap on the roadways and uh, you can begin to understand that gap and how much time you need to clear through an intersection for your own personal safety. Okay, uh, Colin, how do you, do you have something, traffic service request in BC so that law enforcement can work on bad areas? Uh, yeah, ICBC certainly has that. And what Colin is referring to, there are intersections in parts of a province, in parts of a state, uh, depending on where you are, and these authorities that are responsible for this, most of the United States is gonna be the uh, DOT, the Department of Transport here in uh, BC, it's the ICBC, the Insurance Corporation of British Columbia. In Ontario, for example, it's gonna be the MTO. Uh, in Victoria, in Australia, it's gonna be Vic Roads. These authorities crunch statistics and they look at intersections and stretches of road that are susceptible to high numbers of collisions and they try to figure out why these roadways have high numbers of collisions and then they either work to educate the driving public or they change the roadway they do construction and they fix the roadway to try and reduce the number of collisions i know that when i was living in ottawa in the late 1990s uh, highway 17 north of ottawa uh, had a stretch of road that was susceptible to high numbers of traffic crashes and eventually what happened was is that they had to do construction on the roadway and they had to re-engineer the roadway and I think that that eventually moved to uh, reducing the number of traffic crashes and probably Tim uh, will have as well have some information about that as well as about high traffic high crash areas as well uh with drive smart bc you probably have some information about high crash areas and the types of uh campaigns that they put forward to try and reduce the number of traffic crashes i also know that here uh between Kelowna and vernon there was a high crash area 
in the Osuyu's area before they changed the roadway. And <clears throat> excuse me. They've changed the roadway there and they've reduced the number of crashes, okay? So that's one of the things that they do. All right. Uh, Odie, I'm going to recommend your YouTube channel to thousands of Filipino nurses in our Facebook group who just migrated in the USA and just learning to drive. Your channel saves life, saves money from insurance damage. Thank you so much, Odie. And if there's anything specific we can help you out with, uh, definitely drop us a note. We're always happy to help out. Okay. Um, excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, presto, my sister got her license in July 2018. She left for college this se September. Do you think in December when she comes home, she remember how to drive? <laughs> yes, presto, she should remember how to drive. And probably when she's at college, she's probably not just going to stay at college. She's probably going to do some driving there as well. So that's the other thing. Uh, yeah, she's she'll be she'll be fine. <laughs> she'll be doing really well. I. I suspect there. <clears throat> uh, Tim uh, used to use a tool called Traffic Services Management Information, but Google doesn't say anything about it right now. Interesting. So, Traffic Service Management Information. So, these are some of the tools that are available to identify high crash areas. And uh, every year, I believe, Tim, that also ICBC uh, releases information about sort of the top 10 most dangerous intersections in the province of British Columbia. I know that other <clears throat> jurisdictions as well do it. The Department of Transport, probably for different cities in and around the US, probably does that as well. All right. Presto, she didn't take her, her car to college, so she's not driving at all. Oh, okay. Well, she may have to do some refresher uh, courses in terms of driving and those types of things uh, presto, but she I suspect she'll be all, all right when she comes back and you know Somebody can go with her who uh, has some driving experience and those types of things uh, So that's that's what you can do as well uh, Okay, so for those of you going for a road test uh, in the next couple of weeks or you need some refresher You got a road test coming up this week uh, four components of any road test anywhere in the world regardless of where you're taking your license or what class of license you're going for space management speed management observation and communication and of course these are all important in terms of staying crash free not being involved in t-bone crash and those types of things so space management if you're not near anything it's less likely that you're going to hit anything and as well after you get your license as well I strongly encourage you to Consider space management. Keep good space around your vehicle. Uh, space management. Stop at the correct stopping position at intersections before the stop line, before the crosswalk line or sidewalk. And if those two conditions don't exist, then at the edge where the two roads meet. Uh, three, two to three second following distance in a passenger vehicle. If you're driving a larger vehicle, that's going to extend out for those of you driving tractor traders up to five seconds. When you stop in traffic, Stop behind the vehicle in front of you so you can see the tires making clear contact with the pavement. Do not enter an intersection unless you can clear it for the purposes of a road test. If you enter an intersection on a road test that you cannot clear, cannot get through the other side, that's an automatic fail on a road test. Uh, so that's space management, speed management, posted speed limit, flow of traffic, whichever is less. And for those of you driving larger vehicles, it's gonna be the capability of the vehicle. For example, if you're going uphill in an 80 kilometer an hour zone or 50 mile an hour zone, and the vehicle will only do 40 miles an hour, then that's how fast you're going to go. Uh, communication, you need to communicate effectively with other traffic, so lights and signals. Uh, horn, use the horn sparingly though. In this day and age, it's a sign of aggression. Uh, eye contact, if you've got a cyclist or a pedestrian or whatnot, uh, then make sure you have eye contact if you're not sure what that person is doing, that road user is doing. Uh, hand gestures, make sure you use all five fingers, don't tell them they're number one, especially on a road test. And then last and most important is the position of your vehicle on the roadway. If you're in the left hand turning lane, turning left, there's a good chance that that car, that vehicle is going to turn left. And just on that note of the position of your vehicle on the roadway, communicating to other traffic what you are doing, uh, I get a lot of questions about people 
merging onto freeways and they can't get over because there's lots of traffic and those types of things and they signal effectively or signal effectively to move out onto the highway and whatnot move your vehicle to the left side of the lane not out of your lane but to the left side of your lane that's going to crowd the other traffic on the highway and if you have your signal on flashing 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 eventually it's going to freak out the person on the roadway they're going to back off and they're going to create a space for you so that is important in terms of maneuvering merging successfully is crowding that left side of your lane to indicate to the traffic that you do in fact want to move over so and that's communication and then finally observation is key to staying safe on the roadways so you have to implement a scanning pattern far down the roadway uh, in look check the center mirror far down the roadway in check your instrument panel and this is also important for speed control for those of you going on a road test don't use cruise control in a road test you need to keep your speed within three three to five kilometers an hour three to five miles an hour it's not about whether you're going to go over the speed limit or under the speed limit but how long you go over or under the speed limit for the purposes of your road test if you're going over three miles an hour for 10 minutes and, and it, it simply indicates to the examiner that you're not paying attention because within 10 to 20 seconds you should have adjusted that back to the correct speed for the purposes of your road test so down the road check your wing mirrors down the road check both shoulders and then repeat that pattern every 10 to 12 seconds uh, lane changes uh, you need to signal shoulder check look down the road shoulder check again and then if the way is clear then proceed mirror sig signal shoulder check uh, whenever you're turning left you need to do shoulder checks minimum two shoulder checks when you change direction of the vehicle and as well uh, when you're reversing into a to do reverse stall parking or backing the vehicle up for the purposes of your road test 360 degree scan around the vehicle before you move the vehicle and then look out the back window you can use <clears throat> excuse me backup cameras in your wing mirrors but use those sparingly you're going to be looking out the back window for the most part uh, when you're reversing for the purposes of your road test so those are the four major components space management speed management observation communication regardless of where you are in the world what class of license you're uh, doing or uh, how old you are those are the four basic components you need in place for the purposes of passing your road test um, Tim drive smart BC uh, federal collision information and enforcement action uh, into it to make sure police uh, were taking appropriate actions to solve the problem so there you go okay so OD I have downloaded around eight smart Sundays uh, long audio lectures on my USB and play it every time I'm doing a long drive it helps and reduces my anxieties I'm a new driver never had a single crash excellent that's awesome and you know professionalism in terms of driving not just for commercial drivers and we've talked about this uh, actually uh, Tim had a video Tim made a comment on a video on Twitter and there's two trucks one's passing the other truck and you know it's passing lanes but passing lanes on the other side of the road so the driver that's passing is using the oncoming passing lane to pass the truck and the comment is is all oh, look at that guy he's being a, he's being a bonehead passing unsafely on a double solid yellow line and both Tim and I are like well the guy that's being passed isn't slowing down he's holding his course he's holding his speed I mean obviously he's not speeding up as some drivers do but as a professional driver all he or she had to do was take their foot off the throttle and the other vehicle wouldn't have been out in the other lane as long because the other vehicle because when two tractor trailers when a tractor trailer is passing another tractor trailer they're out in the passing lane for a couple of minutes it's a long time <laughs> so you know both Tim and I commented that the guy could have let off the person driver uh, of the one truck could have let off and he reduced the amount of time the other vehicle was there reduce the risk to other drivers on the roadway so be professional it's what Odie's talking about don't just say oh you know I'm a good driver and I can do this you know be professional get more information be more aware when you're driving on the roadways scanning intersections figuring out where intersections are figuring out where off ramps and on ramps are on freeways that way you can scan for other traffic you can figure out where the points of conflict are on the roadway and if you know where those points of conflict are you are on yellow alert 
when you're approaching an intersection and you're seeing other traffic approaching and you can say, okay, is that vehicle slowing down or is that vehicle not slowing down? If that vehicle's not slowing down, not letting off the throttle and preparing to stop, then you need to be preparing to stop. You need to get off the throttle. You need to be looking for your out. And that's how you be a professional driver is by always trying to improve your skills, always trying to be better. Uh, you know, and it, it's not just driving, it's anything that we do in life. Are we working to be better at what we do? It's, you know, with the YouTube channel here and my business and those types of things, I'm always working to be better with that uh, to try and improve the quality of content that I'm delivering to you as smart drivers to help you to be safer, smarter, crash-free drivers. All right. Uh, presto, has anyone ever got a perfect 100 on a road test? No points docked. Uh, how do they do it? Uh, presto, it can be done. It's unusual. It's probably, you know, it's it's not something that it happens very often because most inexperienced drivers are going to make some sort of mistake. Unless you're working with one driving instructor who's taking you on just the driving route and that's all they're doing, uh, then it's, it's really tough to get a perfect score. But I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. It does happen. Okay. Uh, All right, so you can help that out. Uh, Colin, do you know Jane Davis Heavy Towing? No, don't know James Davis. That must be in Calgary there. Um, there you go. So Tim has a suggestion there about e-driving's mentors. That's something that we might try out as well. Okay, Katie, uh, should I slow down if the car is speeding beside me before I reach the intersection? Okay, so not following, Katie, what you're talking about in terms of the question there. Maybe you can just reword that because I'm, I'm not quite sure of the scenario that you're asking me in terms of slowing down there. Michael, uh, when a big truck is getting on the highway and you're going to let him in, flash your brights off and on a couple of times. Yes, you can do that as well. Uh, the other thing, Michael, that I caution you against is at night, <laughs> uh, try not to flash your high beams with big trucks because they're look the driver is looking in the mirror and you flash your high beams. It gives that sparkle effect at night. Uh, so what I often suggest to other people who are trying to help out big trucks is to uh, turn your lights off and on. I know that doesn't work so well with daylight running lights, but that's the other thing you can do if you're going to help them out by doing that. Varun, I passed my G road test last month in Ontario. Dramatically, it was the same examiner who failed me the first time, uh, citing a silly reason. My sincere thanks to you for the enlightenment. Varun, congratulations on passing your road test, and that is awesome that you did that with the exact same examiner because it's, un it's, us it's, not, uh, it's, it's not policy amongst testing centers that they give you the same, same examiner. Oftentimes, they will make sure that you're with a different examiner when you go for another road test. They won't do it with the same one. So congratulations on doing that. Uh, Highway Through Tell, it's on your website. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. I went down and actually trained the filming crew last year and did some winter driving training with them. Uh, Trucker's Life, simple look and use, use the brain. Yes. Epic. Uh, one way to avoid a T-bone accident is actually scanning the intersection ahead and also considering the speed of oncoming traffic. Some cases you have to speed up at an intersection to avoid it. Yes, uh, sometimes you're going to have to be offensive. You're going to have to adjust your speed. And that is definitely something uh, that a lot of drivers struggle with is not controlling the throttle enough, not working the throttle enough. Uh, unfortunately, this often results from poor space management. If you're too close to other traffic, too close to other road users, you're going to find yourself on the brakes a lot. If you find yourself driving down a highway, just start to take note how much you're using the brakes every block of traffic as you're driving down the road. Because if you're using the brakes a lot, often that means that you're too close to the traffic in front of you. And if you're too close, you're at a higher risk of being involved in a crash. And if you can reduce the number of times that you're using your brakes and simply work the throttle, 
and you have adequate space in front of you when you're speeding up a little bit you're going to close the gap and then you're going to back off and you're going to go up and that buffer of space is going to help you reduce the brake so one of the indicators that you're too close to traffic in front of you is you're using the brakes a lot so just kind of be aware of how much you're using the brakes when you're driving um there you go okay jamie davis <laughs> it's in hope highway through hell on the discovery channel yes i don't actually know the people that are in the show in terms of the tow truck drivers uh like i said i worked with the filming crew uh not necessarily the people who were doing the training okay uh carrie i totally agree with you it is extremely important to always be working better on your driving skills definitely it is uh working on your driving skills working on anything that you're doing uh in your life okay presto uh, i see a, a lot of never newer hyundai's and kia's have lane change change cameras you turn on your signal it puts on a camera of your blind spot i haven't actually seen those yet presto uh but that's not surprising that they actually have those now i know that uh a couple of years ago when I rented the Nissan Murano, it had the uh, blind spot indicator. So when there was a, a vehicle that was coming up and in your blind area, a light would illuminate down uh, near the wing mirror. And I found those incredibly helpful. And it's like a lot of tech, uh, you know, it can help you. But on the other hand, if it fails and it's not perfect, uh, I have a... Uh, I have a new Garmin dash cam uh, in my vehicle and it warns when you deviate out of your lane, but it only works, I would probably say it only works about 50% of the time. So I wouldn't rely on that tech. I would still, you know, keep shoulder checking every time you're making a lane change, every time you're going to make a turn because you get relying on that technology that's in your vehicle and then the issue or the problem becomes is that you move to another vehicle you drive another vehicle and now that tech isn't available and then you're you've lost those skills of shoulder checking every time you move the vehicle laterally or you make a turn or whatnot and now you're you know re, you're increasing the risk of being involved in a traffic crash because you got so used to relying on technology and now that technology is not there anymore and especially if you drive <laughs> drive the buggy my you know 20 year old honda crv uh it doesn't have any of that tech in it whereas you know i get at my friend's uh 2016 uh dodge pickup and it's got the screen and the backup cameras and all of the all of that other technology that helps to keep you safe on the roadways uh, jonathan i saw the video and i was like why didn't the guy with the flashing red light just simply stop and the guy with the uh flashing yellow light just simply slow down they had more than opening yeah and you know jonathan on that note of looking at traffic crashes looking in cameras i mean it only gives you so much information it's it you you have no information about the drivers you have no information about whether the drivers are intoxicated or not because you know unfortunately we there are a lot of people on our roadways who are intoxicated they're distracted uh they're not paying attention uh, they didn't see the traffic light because they were, you know, distracted by something else or they, they're thinking about something else or whatnot. So all of this happens and we do not have an insight into that. Uh, single vehicle crashes, for example, we know as traffic safety experts, we know very little about causes of single vehicle crashes. We can make all kinds of assumptions and, and all kinds of a hypothesis about why single vehicle crashes happen uh, because most single vehicle crashes happen at night. So we can hypothesize that the person fell asleep or the driver fell asleep or the driver was intoxicated and simply drove off the road or whatnot. But we have very little information about why these most of these traffic crashes occur. And the other thing that's even more confounding about single vehicle crashes is that they happen on straight roads where the person just drives off the road into the ditch or into a tree or whatnot into a rock or some other fixed object and and traffic safety authorities they simply don't know most of the time why these crashes occur so you know in terms of what happens in terms of uh traffic crashes and those types of things uh you know there's a lot of information that never comes out about uh 
why these traffic crashes occur and those types of things and what you're talking about in terms of red lights and yellow lights why do people run red lights we don't know we don't have all of the specific answers about why these things happen okay uh, okay Carrie I'm gonna talk about Anne here just in a moment I'll just answer a couple more questions and I'll come back to that uh, Tim I've heard that some drivers turn driving assist features off as they are receiving too many warnings and and I can totally agree with that uh, Tim my Garmin has four different warnings on it it'll tell me when traffic is moving it'll tell me whether I'm approaching an intersection with a red light camera on it it'll tell me if I have uh, front collision warning if I'm too close to the traffic in front of me and lane departure and it gets a bit annoying so I couldn't imagine being in a vehicle one of these newer vehicles like the 2017 pilot I was in that I couldn't get it to move because I wasn't because it completely locks out if you don't have your seatbelt fastened some of this there's too much information and it's information overload and I come back to traffic signs and why drivers uh, don't look at traffic signs because there's simply too many traffic signs and we haven't put traffic signs in strategically so that we're giving the absolute relevant information to drivers uh, they're you know they're just overwhelmed so instead of trying to filter out and figuring out which information from the traffic signs is important rather what they're doing is they're just simply refusing to read them and as Tim said a lot of people are turning off these uh, safety features inside their vehicles so Carrie was asking me about Ann I had a meeting with Ann today and we got talking about that so she had a traffic crash uh, that limited her mobility in 1980 and she's three years ago she had another crash here in Vernon where she was a pedestrian uh, in her wheelchair and she was coming across the roadway and because of the way that the curb is cut out she had to come around to the other side I'm not explaining this very well but she was coming across this way and she had to go around this way to get up onto the sidewalk and a right turning truck and trailer went around and hit her and that's what destroyed her electric wheelchair so we're moving forward with this campaign to raise twenty five thousand dollars Canadian because the, the wheelchair the electric wheelchair is prox probably eighteen thousand dollars American so I'm gonna write up that and we're gonna move forward with the hundred thousand K campaign and the monies donated to the hundred thousand K campaign are going to go to helping and uh, get an electric wheelchair so this is the thrust of the campaign this is what we're going to be doing and like I said I'll, I'll put a page up give more information uh, about Anne and what she's doing and her hardships and how we can help her out with donating money to that so every all the monies for the 100k campaign are going to be going towards uh, the purchase of that wheelchair for Anne and helping her out uh, to get her that and improve her quality of life uh, so like I said more information coming and we're getting we're moving forward with that all right Michael the distraction thing the gal that rear-ended me said she looked up and the light was green I thought to myself where did you look after that yeah exactly so again uh, Michael one of the things that I'm beginning to think is is that with intersections and one of the reasons why inexperienced drivers or drivers who don't deal with that kind of traffic situation a lot is because there's simple simply too much information and one of the things that differentiates inexperienced or novice drivers from experienced drivers is, is that experienced drivers are able to look at a complex intersection and filter out all of the non-essential information that's going to keep them safe and exactly what you were talking about when the person rear ends you they're looking up they're looking at the traffic light and then looking forward to see whether the traffic is actually moving or stopped or whether what they have to do in response to that traffic on the roadway and I'll give you another uh, example of that some years ago uh, a woman I knew had pulled out on uh, a merging lane that merged out onto a multi-lane highway and there was a vehicle in front of her and she's looking to see whether the way is clear looking out the side of the vehicle and the vehicle in front of her she took off but then stopped again because the gap closed up or whatnot and then she did, she was looking sideways and then drove forward and drove into the back of the vehicle in front of her so it's important that when we're scanning when we're looking to pull out onto roadways or in intersections or those types of things 
you're looking sideways to find your gap as well but then quickly you're looking forward again to make sure that the traffic in front of you is, is still moving or isn't hasn't come to a stop or those types of things so it's difficult because there is a lot of uh, activity going on and the activity that's going on is that activity relevant to what you're doing or is it not relevant and how do we differentiate that information as drivers to keep ourselves safe when we're moving through an intersection uh, presto they may make an exception if they think I'm ready or <laughs> they're going to sell the SUV uh, there we go so presto is uh, you're still working on getting your parents to let you drive the SUV uh, so they said uh, I have to go a year without crashes after I get my license problem is the SUV will probably be sold by the time I hit that point. <laughs> uh, there we go excellent Odie uh, when you see a highway signal with an image of a deer what is the emphasis of the driver's side uh, sorry for the question I'm a new driver in the US no uh, that's a good question Odie uh, the deer on a cautionary sign so we're talking about a diamond shaped sign it's a black symbol on a yellow background that warns that there is a high number of deer in that area and they are susceptible to crossing on the roadway or standing along the edge of the roadway and whatnot so it's indicating to drivers that you need to be on high alert for animals uh, along the roadways or on the roadway it's very it's not likely that they're on the roadway often what happens with animal car collisions is, is that the animal is on the side of the road and then they step out into the front of traffic is often what happens with that so uh, you know one a couple of uh, precautions that you can put in place is there are deer whistles that you can put mount on your vehicle they're little plastic uh, tubes and they when the wind goes through them they create a high pitch frequency that animals can hear so that's one thing that you can do I don't know what the success rate is on those I know a number of people have had some success with them uh, the other thing is again looking far down the road having your high beams on if, if you're allowed with oncoming traffic and whatnot and seeing the reflection in their eyes because if there is headlights it will reflect in the animals eyes and those types of things but simply knowing that after dark uh, different times of the year there are going to be a high number of deer and animals along the roadways and those types of things all right uh, Nabel let's say I'm waiting for a left turn signal and my left turn signal goes green specific signal for left turn and I see a pedestrian from the left side crossing on their red am I supposed to wait yes uh, Nabel again it comes back to am I, even though you have the right of way and somebody has taken up that space you can't simply just negate the fact that they're there you do have to wait for them and you know wait a few seconds they'll clear the intersection and then you can proceed when the gap is sufficient but don't just drive into people on the roadway because you had the right of way you can be right or you can be dead right so you know the right of way is always given it's not taken so you have to give the right of way to that road user who's taking up your space okay traveling photographer okay so excellent thank you for that contribution Michael I was at a red light when it turned green I took off and not more than 10 feet she hit me I think she was texting or at least looking at her phone yeah and unfortunately Michael one of the things about that is it's it's gonna be you're never gonna know what she was doing unless you know police do an investigation and pull her phone records or those types of things you're just not gonna know and the disturbing information about texting and driving people talking on uh, handheld phones those types of things and this was years ago I mean this was probably eight years ago I read this information that came out from the uh, American uh, Automotive Association in the United States even at that time before we have all the awareness about distracted driving and those types of things 66% uh, of Americans admitted to talking on a phone while driving your vehicle not a handheld device and 33 percent of americans were probably talking you know there's 300 million people in america we're probably talking 100 million probably talking 70 80 million people admitted to texting and driving so there are a large number of people texting and driving and this is why the fines associated with texting and driving are so severe because there are so many people who are doing it unfortunately the high fines do not distract 
do not deter people from doing this and what they're doing is called deterrence policing they uh, pull people over they prosecute and convict them of, of that offense and then they publish it in the papers and they try to deter other people from doing it but unfortunately these campaigns are not working we still have a high number of people who are talking on cell phones a high number of people who are distracted by technology inside of their vehicle uh, telematics and whatnot and we also have a high number of people who are texting and driving and unfortunately uh, you know because it's just seen as a bad thing in our society we're not teaching people how to do it and that has been not just with distracted driving with texting and driving and those types of things it's also that's been put forward by other people uh, in terms of drinking and driving and being distracted are you know uh, uh, being drunk behind the wheel because that happens at a, at a higher rate than we would like to think as well and a high number of people you know now that marijuana is legal in a lot of states and a lot of provinces uh, you know a lot of people are, are you know they're high when they're driving their vehicle as well so you know driving is in my mind is not getting easier it's getting more and more challenging and more difficult okay Jeff I watch you a lot I am 71 years old uh, your videos keep my mind sharp and excellent thanks so much Jeff for that glad that we can help out if you have any questions at all drop us a note we'll be more than happy to try and help you out and do what we can I'm glad that we're keeping your mind sharp all right Katie can I turn in the direction of the arrow if the light is yellow uh, you can Katie but you have to know that for the purposes of a road test yellow and red lights are the same color they essentially mean that you have to stop so know that for the purposes of your road test uh, Michael my opinion is texting is just as dangerous as drinking and driving and it definitely definitely is Michael there's absolutely all of the information coming out about uh, texting and driving it's absolutely your uh, attention is taking taken away from the task of driving so yes I uh, definitely agree with you there okay uh, alright presto my mom told me she never drinks because one of her best friends was killed by a drunk driver a long time ago yes and unfortunately a lot of people have been injured killed or maimed in traffic crashes due to other people being intoxicated or texting and driving and those types of things uh, all right so we're getting near the end here and uh, Carrie thank you for all the great defensive driving advice on how to avoid being involved in a crash so happy we can help out Carrie and keep you safe on the roadways presto when approaching a yellow light on a road test when should you stop or proceed typically excellent question presto uh, we will just finish up with this last point here on yellow traffic lights this is something that takes a bit of experience and I encourage drivers to go out and actually work and experience yellow lights because you need to know that no vehicle will stop in its own length so if you're one vehicle length from the intersection then you need to proceed through the intersection you need to scan the intersection proceed through cautiously cover the brake for the purposes of a road test if you're more than one vehicle length from the intersection you're gonna have to get the vehicle stopped uh, you can't proceed through the intersection because if you go through the intersection and you look up through the top of the windscreen the windshield and the light turns red when you're in the middle of the intersection that is an automatic fail on a road test I can guarantee you that the number of students that I've worked with <coughs> excuse me who have proceeded through an intersection when the light went yellow and I looked up through the top of the windscreen I saw the light go red halfway through the intersection if you do that with a driving examiner on a road test I can guarantee you automatic fail because you just ran a red light so do not enter an intersection unless you can clear that intersection on the yellow alright so yellow lights it takes a bit of practice it's a bit of experience but you need to either decide to go or stop one vehicle length or farther from the intersection then you're gonna to have to come to a stop and if you're driving a larger vehicle <laughs> you may have to lock it up with a bit of smoke and screaming tires and whatnot so there you go for the purposes of your road test all right so if you had a road test in the last couple of weeks and you passed congratulations on that if you have one coming up here in the next week or so good luck on that uh, Michael thanks Katie thank you uh, Rudy thanks a lot for your driving test videos help me a lot I got my driver's license on the first time that is awesome Ruby so glad that we can help out 
and if you want to go over and sign up for the 100k campaign that would be great and Corey put the video up for you on how to deal with yellow lights so for more information about yellow lights definitely have a look at that so thanks very much for watching and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer have a great day bye now